October 16th. Before we start today, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the tragedy that happened in our area over the weekend. On behalf of Council, I'd like to extend our deepest condolences to the friends and families of everyone impacted. I'd also like to thank all of the people who rushed um, in response in a very challenging time, um, including our local fire department, our CMP, search and rescue, um, the amazing staff at West Coast General Hospital, BC Ambulance, uh, Hue at First Nation, and city staff um, working on behalf of ACRD. It was a horrible tragedy um, to see happen in our area, but I'm really proud of how our community um, and the communities around us reacted and responded to make a very challenging time as comfortable as possible for the people involved. And I'd also, um, just getting started today now, um, would like to recognize that we have uh, Freedom of the City, Jim Sawyer in the room. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> And before we start, we want to recognize the unceded that we're holding our meeting on the unceded traditional territories of Sashot and Hupachesset First Nations. So we have an agenda in front of us. Are there any late items? No late items, Madam Mayor. Okay. And any late items from councillors? Seeing none, would somebody like to move approval of our agenda? So moved. Second, Madam Mayor. Okay. All in favor? Carried. We have minutes of the special meeting held at 12.30 p.m. and the regular meeting held at 2 p.m. on September 3rd, 2019. Move to adopt. Is there a seconder? Any questions or comments or changes to the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. And that brings us to public input period. Um, public input period is an opportunity for members of the public to address Council on topics of relevance to City Council. We normally take a maximum of four speakers, but given that there's a lot of people in the audience today, um, just asking if Council would be okay with taking six speakers for today. Great. Um, given that, who would like to speak? Come on forward. So just so that you know, if you could introduce yourself, your name and address for the record, and then um, we give three minutes to speak. Um, I am the chair of the Community Arts Council. I live at 5637 Mersey Road. Um, we were made to understand yesterday that council intends to put a tax on the revenue from the Roland Art Gift Shop and Gallery. And this tax is 19.4% of our revenue which is $26,000 from the gift shop and gallery. Am I wrong? I'm getting some. Yeah, just the, um, we're not, we actually don't have the authority to implement a tax. Um, so I think what you're being impacted for or by is our permissive tax permissive exemption ta policy exemption. is changing. That's right. And that's impacting and reducing your permissive tax exemption. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. We understand what you're talking about generally, so it doesn't matter <laughs> if it's, if it's um, it impacts you in the same way. So the, um, the $26,000, I, I would like everyone to understand, is the gross revenue. We pay 70% of that 26000 to the artists who put their things in our gift shop or exhibit at our gallery. So if the council intends to go ahead with this, I'm not going to say exactly what it is, we all understand, uh, which we hope you won't, it should only be on 30% of that. And I would just like to comment that we are feeling a bit aggrieved about this because last year, for a board of seven people, we put a huge effort into fundraising, um, trying to get donations and grants. And after trying three times, we got the grant from the 100 Women Organization of close to $20,000. And we also received grant from the Charity Golf Classic, which we had to work hard for. We put every single cent of both of those grants, the 100 women, into the building of the Roland Arts Center. We put a new roof, new windows, we painted it, we fixed the deck. We put the rest of the money into the garden, renovating it, making it more accessible and easier to maintain. We didn't take any for ourselves, and we did as good a job using local tradesmen and businesses as we possibly could. And this is all for a building and grounds that we do not own. 
This building and grounds is owned by the city of Port Alberni, who declined to help us with doing this. And so we did it on our own. And so we are feeling a bit upset about getting tax on this specific um, permissive tax exemption. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who would like to speak next? Come on forward. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Brent Ronning. I'm picking up things I drop. Um, I'm the chair for Portal Players Dramatic Society, owners of the Capitol Theater. Uh, I live at 4422 Latham Road. Um, I am also here to address the permissive tax exemption bylaw 4497. Um, the, uh, I think that it, again, it unfairly targets the arts in our community. We know that sports are always well supported in our community. For some reason, this, this permissive tax exemption specifically goes after um, alcohol sales and, uh, um, and revenue um, that's, that goes off of the traditional fundraising kind of ideas for nonprofits. Um, we, we know that in our modern British Columbia, social profits are what keeps nonprofit societies going. And arts organizations are less well supported in communities. We have to be creative in how we fundraise. And we do things like gift shops for artists. And we do things like sell alcohol in our lobbies, which costs a substantial amount of money to maintain our, our uh, liquor license and as well as the volunteers to keep our bar stocked. But those are because we want to deliver a better service to our patrons who want to have a glass of wine during an intermission and we want to be able to provide that to them legally. Um, so I, I feel that the permissive uh, tax exemption bylaw, it's, it's penalizing creative fundraising efforts. Um, I mean, would the city prefer that we nonprofits rely more on traditional fundraising and ask our community for donations rather than providing goods and services? I'm also concerned that it's a slippery slope that you're coming after revenue um, that we get for alcohol and for um, material commercial sales. Um, are you going to come after our program sales next? Um, that's that is a goods and that's a goods and service that we deliver as a nonprofit organization in our community. Um, and uh, um, I mean, we would rather. Um, we would rather do things that add and enhance what we deliver to our community and rather than relying on our community just for donations and handouts. We would rather provide something in addition um, to their experience. So thank you for considering my thoughts on this. Thank you very much. Are there other members of the public who would like to speak today? There's got to be more people in a room full. <laughs> Okay, just asking one more time in case anyone wants to change their mind. Okay. Okay, so that brings us to delegations. And our first delegation today is from Pam Craig in attendance to present information on the Mike Downey presentation. Thank you very much, Madam Welcome. Mayor and uh, councillors. Uh, I appreciate the time to come today. I know I've spoke to you before about this, but the time is going by, and uh, we'll soon have Mike Downey in our community to present not only to the public, but also to our students. And I just wanted to remind you of some of the information around this special event. Um, Mike Downey is the co-founder of the Gord Downey and Chani Wenjack Fund, which aims to inspire Canadians to walk a path of reconciliation and help bring together Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. He is a celebrated storyteller. And he heard of this story of a young lad who died on his way home from a residential school. He ran away and was trying to get home and he passed away in that effort. And Mike knew that he was such a great storyteller. He told this story to his brother Gord, who you know as a member of the Tragically Hip, and Gord passed away just two years ago. 
So together the two brothers got together and developed the secret path story. And that was uh, an album, a music album, a graphic novel, and um, an animated film. And I have a copy of the book here with me today. If you will recognize it, likely seeing it on the news and so on. And Mike himself is a, a writer, a director, and a producer of many documentaries. So he's a very talented individual. I have experienced his presentation and it is very powerful. And for me, it was to bring that powerful presentation to our young students. So in School District 70, grades 8 through 12 will be able to see Mike uh, present this on October the 24th and they will come to the high school for that presentation, including the West Coast students. So Mike will be here on Friday, October 25th at ADSS Theater at 7 p.m. to present uh, the making and the creation of the secret path. Um, I will be uh, speaking with him on the phone and get a few details coming forward from that. And just to let the community know and to counselors know, if you're interested in participating and seeing this presentation, the tickets are limited because it will be at ADSS. And the tickets are available at ADSS office or at the school board office. And our district parent advisory council asked that we uh, offer the tickets for free, but by donation if people wish. So that offers an, a chance for many families to take advantage of this. And so our event is sponsored by, of course, the school district, uh, the Alberni District Teachers Union, the Alberni District Parent Advisory Council, Huwayat First Nations, INEO Employment Services, and Mid-Island Remax Realty. So I just want to make sure that you're all aware that this is happening. If you're interested in going to that special event, please get your tickets soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and next on our list of delegations is Western Vancouver Island Industrial Heritage, uh, members in attendance to provide a presentation of their current events. Welcome, and I forgot to mention with Pam, but for delegations we allow 10 minutes. Thanks. All right, uh, I'd like to thank Madam Mayor and Council for this opportunity. My name is David Doom, and I'm 3816 Keha Drive. I'm here to present on behalf of Western Vancouver Island Industrial Heritage Society. Public speaking is not my forte, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, I'll just get into this because we're kind of short of time on this one. So, uh, The society was created in uh, 1983. So 36 years, they've been a positive and constructive part of the community. Now, the mandate of the society is the collection, restoration, and preservation of industrial artifacts. and a goal of bringing history alive by having artifacts restored to operational condition. The society acts as community ambassadors. We make appearances out of town and in town, of course, we do tour groups. The society participated in 1986 in the Vancouver Steam Expo show and parade with a two spot, a logging truck and steam donkey. They presented a live logging demonstration to an international audience of hundreds of thousands of people. More recently, this year, we've participated in the American Trucking Association, pardon me, American Trucking Historical Society show in Reno, Nevada. This is the biggest vintage truck show in North America. Our model Challenger was the hit of the show. It's a quarter scale Challenger truck. These appearances put Port Alberni and Vancouver Island on the map. We also do many appearances at communities on Vancouver Island <coughs> with annual invitational return visits. These are some pictures of the equipment we took down to Reno. And the model challenger in the bottom right there is a quarter scale model. It was the hit of the show, definitely a crowd pleaser. The restored Far Core steam tractor, I have a little story about this, but time is short. If you want to ask me about the story after the presentation, please note I have GoPort Alberni and a smiley face. There's a reason for that. So. Uh, some of the things this group has done in the past here in the community, <coughs> constructing the roundhouse building, train station restoration, water tower construction, help managing and maintaining the McLean Mill historic site, the IHS arena collection, including the city industrial collection, train station rail operations of McLean Mill, including training of personnel, <coughs> painting the IHS arena, being mindful of costs, electrical upgrades, and installation of LED lighting in the IHS arena, 
<coughs> has led to a 50% reduction in the hydro bill. This was done at no expense to the city. Uh, the conversion of the CN cabooses to passenger cars for train to the McLean Mill, <coughs> large contributor of volunteer hours, to restore, preserve, and display the city industrial collection. Now, our collection consists of trucks, trains, and equipment. Uh, I got myself mixed up here. A lot of IHS volunteers and equipment have been <coughs> used to maintain and enhance the McLean Mill historic site. This includes a skidder, a log loader, forklift, bull moose crane truck, bulldozer, Euclid truck, and other items. <coughs> now, the number seven steam locomotive <coughs> with the train at the station. The boiler makers continue to make progress on rebuilding the number seven boiler. We thank the boiler. <coughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm croaking. Appreciate that. The boiler makers. We want to thank the Boilermakers for this incredible effort, which has been donated to the community benefit. We all look forward to hear, hearing the hiss of the steam and the echo of the whistle in the Alberni Valley again. Uh, there's been ongoing work these with the Vandals. Many of you heard of that. Uh, we had to cancel last Friday because the kids don't have rain gear to, and we're a little concerned about safety working in the rain. But there, that is an ongoing thing and that they will be back to give us another round of help there. The GoFundMe campaign we had for that has been shut down now. We've raised over $3,500 in that, <coughs> which will be used for the cars. Uh, the other pictures up here, a uh, fire truck with a bunch of kids. We do often uh, do tours and give rides to kids, young people up at the arena. The yellow speeder restored by the Heritage Society and the baby Euclid, which has been given some restorative maintenance, paint job and decals. It's looking pretty good now. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm moving on here. The skeleton car there is on display down at the station, built by Ray Barron. <coughs> the number 11 locomotive fully restored by HS volunteers <coughs> with funds from the BCIT conductor courses. Before and after pictures of the Army truck, and these restorations the guys do in these trucks just amazes me. <coughs> now, this is a 1909 CN caboose from 2014. I was involved in taking the three Lars of siding off this car, and I thought, light a match and see what's left. <coughs> At that time, I didn't know what these guys were capable of, and this is the caboose today <coughs> without the fire. <coughs> it's an almost unbelievable transformation. transformation. Interior work in progress, but nearing completion. Every square inch of the interior has been meticulously researched, restored, painted, and fitted with period fixtures and artifacts. We have many volunteers, but I'll only mention a couple. Our super volunteer in this picture, Frank Holm, has been the main contributor to this project. He has taken on as a personal mission. He has contributed time and financial resources to this project. We talk about thousands of volunteer hours. Frank has personally contributed thousands of hours, <coughs> not only in this amazing restoration, but also performing other roles, including train conductor, lawn mowing, weed eating, maintenance at McLean Mill, giving guided tours of the mill, and countless behind the scenes tasks including the cherry Sunday morning donuts, which magically appear for other volunteers. <coughs> Our volunteer base consists of youth to seniors. So we call the community if you have a trade or a particular skill or not, <coughs> there is always a place to help out. If you can offer a little or a lot, you'll be welcomed and appreciated. Thousands of society volunteers hours are donated to the community. In 2018, 70, over 7,400 hours were donated at $20 per hour equates to $148,000. Many of these hours are by skilled tradespeople whose services are, and expertise are worth far more than $20 per hour. <coughs> Jan Jasma, is other volunteer I'll mention. He, here he is entering the 1882 Strathcona parlor car <coughs> where he and some other volunteers have been painstakingly doing a restoration to one half of the car with the the idea of a before and after restoration section. While passing through the car one day, Jan began explaining in detail how they were experimenting with different methods of removing century old layers <coughs> of varnish from the intricate hand carved woodwork in the car. I realized how passionate Jan was about this project. I was trying to thank Jan for his efforts when he said something quite profound that has stuck with me ever since. <coughs> he said, Dave, you have to thank, you don't have to thank me. I come here because this gets me out of bed. If I didn't have this to work on, I would have no reason to get out of bed in the morning. I've been reflecting on his words since then. 
There's more to a picture than meets the eye. There's a much larger sociological lesson here, which means <coughs> having venues and projects for seniors to contribute and enjoy life is money well spent and as important as building nursing homes for people that don't have that reason to get out of bed in the morning. I hope everyone here gets an opportunity to stay young like Jan and you get a chance to tour through this Drothgona rail car with Jan as your guide. And Jan doing what Jan does, <coughs> explaining the history of the car to a group of children. There is a letter from the cruise ship passengers in May to Jan, which I'll give you copies of later. I don't have time to fit. I wanted to read this, but I really don't have time to fit it in here. Now this is a group, our young kids interacting with our volunteers at the IHC. There are several students, uh, school trips come through there. We participate with the Heritage Days and with our equipment and our volunteers interacting with young people. <coughs> At the bottom left of this picture, I want to speak about a man with a vision of creating an old-time logging show demonstration, <coughs> the legendary one and only Jack James. If ever there has been an example of bringing history alive, this show has been a great example of it. Countless IHS volunteer hours <coughs> have gone into making it a show with international recognition and repeat visitors. This is a community treasure to be proud of. This view, McLean Mill, log pond, spar tree, steam donkey, and a variety of IHS equipment. <clears throat> and if you'll indulge us, I'll turn the podium over to Mr. David Hooper, who will enlighten us on some recent activities of society. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I don't think we're running over, but bear with us. We're gonna welcome Dave Hooper forward anyways. <laughs> Thanks, Dave, and thank you, Madam Mayor and Councillors. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is David Hooper, 2926 12th Avenue. I'm the editor of the IHS, the Industrial Heritage Society newsletter, and I'm a part of the JJ Logging Crew that has done the old time steam logging demonstrations at the McLean Mill for the last nine years. I'm going to give a brief report on two of our most recent events. An old time logging demonstration for a visiting group of foresters and the antique trucks and machinery show two weeks ago. On September 1st, that was the 90th birthday of the steam donkey at the McLean Mill. And this coincided with the visit of a forestry tour group from Sweden. It's the fifth such group from Sweden in the past four years. They come here because they can see current forestry practices as well as the history preserved at the McLean Mill. They saw the steam sawmill in action during their first visit, 2016, as well as watching a steam logging demonstration. They're interested in the Swedish connection to the logging industry because so many young Swedes came here to work in the last century. The Swedes, not a century ago, the Swedes stay at the Barclay Hotel, eat in local restaurants, and they used to ride the train too. And yes, we did have a birthday cake for the donkey with coffee. Uh, Swedes like their coffee. Since 2011, we have given more than 170 old time steam logging demonstrations at the mill site for visitors from all corners of the world. We have the only steam donkey rigged to a wooden spar tree remaining operational in the world. It's here in the Alberni Valley, and that's why the Swedes come here. Our annual antique trucks and machinery show took place at the same time as the Salmon Festival, making for a big Alberni weekend. More than 1,500 people came to check out the more than 75 vehicles and displays on the site. The miniature steam train, the model boat pond, and the radio-controlled model trucks and machines were a big hit. Many young families and children attended. Participants came from all corners of Vancouver Island, as well as from the mainland, from as far away as Nelson. Local hotels and restaurants and the salmon barbecue benefited from this event. For Industrial Heritage members who work out of the Industrial Heritage Center, this was an all hands on deck affair and it's our biggest event of the year. We're proud to display the artifacts that are in the city's industrial collection. 
most of which are on display and cared for in that building. And it's also known as one of the premier such museums in the province. It's a weekend to show, show off this stuff to Port Alberni as well as to visitors from outside. At the Boat Basin, an obstacle challenge course was organized by the boat people for members of City Council. A big thank you to the Mayor and councillors who participated. Now, to avoid any suggestion of bias, an out-of-towner judged the efforts of the participants. And I was informed that the award for superior navigational skills goes to... It can't be you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I thought I did a really good job on that, and it was not easy. <laughs> you, you would know it was not easy by uh, Councillor Corbeil's performance. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hooper, and um, thank you for welcoming me to take part in both of those events. Um, I really enjoyed getting to be a part of the um, Steam Donkey's 90th birthday as well. And Sven, of course, it was Sven's 90th birthday as well. Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> Council, are there any questions? No? Okay. Um, well, thanks again for all that you guys are doing in the community. Um, I'm not sure if it's been received by your board yet, but we have um, I've written a letter on behalf of council about um, the train operations and um, what the city needs to see in order to talk about train. So um, I think we'll be hopefully getting together to talk about next steps as soon as possible as well. So thank you. Okay. Um, our next delegation from the Alberni Valley Senior Citizens, Senior Citizens Home Society. Um, we have a representative to speak and I believe, is it Gay? Wonderful. Good afternoon, Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for allowing us to speak with you today. My name is Gay Allen, 5900 Fall Street. I'm a director and the secretary of the Alberni Valley Senior Citizens Home Society, and with me is Sandra Rose, our office manager for the society. Um, today we're going to address you regarding the full and partial denials, denials of the application for the permissive tax exemption for Pioneer Cottages and Pioneer Towers. Now, Sandra Rose is going to speak to you about low and moderate income as defined under Schedule A of the BC Housing CPI operating agreement, which we have with them. And you were provided with that uh, application in your uh, tax exemption that we filed. Okay. So, Gay, or I attended the last city council meeting, and uh, one of your spokespeople. Uh, made a reference to the $71,810 as an income level uh, for our cottages. And I just wanted to speak on that because the interpretation of that can be left wide open. Um, so under our Schedule A general provisions, I'm just going to read it out. For residential units with less than two bedrooms, a gross household income that does not exceed the median income for families without children, so that would mean married or common-law couple, or one person. Uh, as determined by BC Housing from time to time, this amount was set at $71,810 uh, per year. Uh, so to define a medium in, in the medium, uh, gross medium household income, it refers to the income level earned by a given household where half of the homes in the area earn above that amount and the other half of the homes earn below that amount. And it's used instead of an average because it's more accurate. Um, median household incomes are frequently used to determine housing affordability. So in the 2016 census for Port Alberni, we'll just use that as an example for, uh, um, it's identified that Port Alberni's median income is 50,000, approximately 50,000, it's just over that. So the 71,000 as referenced in our general provisions of our operating agreement is the median household income for families without children set by the province. I recently looked at one bedroom listings in and around Vancouver uh, because, uh, oh, and I'll just carry on. 
around Vancouver and couldn't find one for less than $1,800 a month. And some were up to $2,500. So to give you a picture of how the median income level works for purposes of this presentation, we'll use BC Housing's formula to determine if a single person over 16 Vancouver making $71,000 can annually can actually afford these, these rentals. So BC Housing identifies that a person's rent should be no more than 30% of their household income. If you take the 71,800, 30% of that is $5,430 and we divide that by 12. And you would get a total of 1795. So a senior renting of one bedroom for over 1795 under BC Housing standards could qualify for a subsidy under the SAFER grant. BC Housing SAFER subsidy. I'm not sure if everybody's aware of that. So in, in reference to the cottages, 40%, 2% of our cottages are rent for an average of $825 per month. So if we look at that number and use the calculation by BC Housing, 34,000 would be the income. Uh, you multiply that by 30%, that gives you 9,000, and divide that by 12, that's $850. So anyone making less than 34,000 living in one of these units could or would qualify for BC Housing subsidy under their Safe Old Renter Grant. As we are not subsidized housing and do not offer rent gear to income, rent amounts, or yeah, we don't offer rent to, gear to income rent amounts, this subsidy is paid directly to the tenant, tenant, not to the society. So I just want to make sure that people are aware we don't get the subsidy from BC Housing. So 58% of the units in the cottages are rented for $615 a month. Some of these tenants qualify for safer subsidy, I know because I signed their paperwork, which means these persons would fall at or below $24,000 in gross household income based on BC Housing's calculations or formulas that we use. So I just wanted to say our purpose is to provide affordable housing for seniors who are in the low to fixed, up, fixed income group. Thank you very much and Gay will continue. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sandra. Um, I'm providing you with the following information as it refers to the city's recommendation that Pioneer Cottages be denied the 2020 to 2023 permissive tax exemption. To date, our society has not received official notice from the city that our application was denied or any information as to how to respond or prove that we qualify, and this is why we're here today. We provided information last week to all members of council that illustrates the difference between our society and the other organizations that were referred to at the September 3rd council meeting. Referred to were residential housing with legal suites, Abbey Field, Heritage Place, and Fur Park and Echo Villages. Residential housing with legal suites does not qualify under the permissive tax exemption policy eligibility criteria as the organization must be a nonprofit or registered charity, correct? Abbey Field did not apply for the tax exemption. We don't know the details, but we've heard that they have a lease with the city for the city-owned property that they use that requires that the property taxes be paid by their society. And we just would like that verified from you. Um, Heritage Place didn't apply for the exemption. It's an assisted living facility and we understand that they are covered under Section 224J of the Community Charter and possibly VHA funds their taxes. For Park and Echo Villages, they're also covered under Section 2244J of the Community Charter. The buildings and the land that the buildings occupy are exempt. They are not seniors' rental housing, they're care facilities. We will also address the information provided regarding the land surrounding Pioneer Towers and Cottages and give you some background information. The Society owns all the land from 8th and Wallace to 10th and Wallace that was occupied by the original cottages that were built in 1960s and then rebuilt again in 2010. The Pioneer Towers was built in the 70s and these buildings were built and are owned by the Alberni Valley Senior Citizen Society. In uh, 1980, the Alberni Clyquot Continuing Care Society approached our society to negotiate a lease agreement for the land between Pioneer Towers and Pioneer Cottages in order to build Fur Park Village. In this agreement, they pay $1 a year and the property taxes. Next, please refer to line 104, uh, page 104, line 4 and 6 of the September 3rd agenda. Line four refers to the Alberni 
Adequate Continuing Care Society for Park and Echo Villages. And I quote from that, uh, lease $1 from city property to be paid by leasee. Strip of property leased from the city for parking lot, bus shelter, and access to care home for Park, Echo Village, Pioneer Towers, Pioneer Cottage. All are exempt except for Pioneer Cottages. Therefore, the exemption is for 66.67 of the land. Now, the society is questioning why the Alberni Valley Senior Citizens properties are included in this lease agreement. Our society is a separate society from the Alberni Clyquot Continuing Care Society. We were never involved or inf in, uh, informed of any negotiations with the city uh, concerning this matter. Um, we're requesting clarification of the lease agreement that was made between the city and ACCCS and what the financial implications are for our society, Alberni Valley Senior Citizens Home Society. Uh, Pioneer Cottages, the only access to Pioneer Cottages is off Wallace Street. The entrance and exit is used by emergency vehicles, care providers, tenants, visitors, and maintenance companies. We are citing the article in the Community Charter and Permissive Tax Exemption as we feel that Pioneer Cottages qualifies for the Permissive Tax Exemption under this section. The condensed summary of Section 224 of the Community Charter says land or improvements that are owned or held by a charitable, philanthropic, or other non-profit corporation. And it is difficult for us to understand what calculations were determined, were used to determine what land was recommended for taxes to be paid as the society doesn't know the contents of the lease agreement between the city and Alberni Continuing Care Society. On to Pioneer Towers. Please note that the Wallace Street access at 4467 Wallace Street is shared by both ACCS for Park and Echo Vill or for Park and the Alberni Valley Senior Citizens Home Society, Pioneer Towers, for emergency vehicles, care providers, tenants, residents, and visitors. The access off 8th Avenue provides access to for Park Village uh, for mortuary service, maintenance vehicles, as well as for the towers for garbage services, tenant and guests to Pioneer Towers Activity Room, which is used by other nonprofit societies and move in and move out access. Um, on page 104 of the September 3rd agenda of City Council, line 6, the entire building and 21% of the land exempt under section 2201I, assessed value $2,983.616 from, and the city taxes foregone are 20106 now, in the past, Pioneer Towers has been 100% exempt from property taxes and land improvements. This year, the City of Port Alberni will not be supporting the Alberni Valley Senior Citizens Home Society, uh, Pioneer Towers, 100%, and as we read it, will now be assessing 79% of the land from the community's recommendations to Council, or the committee's recommendations to Council on the ta permissive tax. On the BCE assessment website, it shows that the area of land for 4427 or 67 Wallace Street, Pioneer Towers, is 2,147 square feet or 0 0.4930 acres. And this falls below the maximum 0.5 to be exempt that is mentioned for churches. The society is questioning the reason behind the decision to partially tax the land at Pioneer ta uh, Towers and also the, we don't know what land it refers to. Mm -hmm. uh, the following is an article of the charter that supports exemption for the land surrounding the towers, including road access and parking under the city of Port Alberni's permissive tax exemption policy number three, eligibility criteria. Exemptions will not be granted for land held for future development or land greater than normally required for off street parking. In conclusion, the Alberni Valley senior citizens was formed over 60 years ago by a group of community-minded citizens, unions, volunteers, service groups, and churches who recognize the need for safe, affordable housing for seniors. From the 1960s until 2015, the City Council of Port Alberni supported the society by recognizing the value of safe, affordable housing for seniors, as well as the commitment of volunteer members 
of the board by providing a permissive tax exemption through their residential taxes. That support has allowed the society to maintain this safe, affordable housing by re reinvesting in the facilities, for example, a new elevator, a, remo a refurbished elevator, new windows, roof, and a hot water system just in the last few years. In 2010, when planning the new construction, the City Council of the day understood the value of affordable housing for seniors and actually encouraged the society to increase the number of units at the cottages from 26 to 41 and granted the permissive tax exemption. On several occasions, city employees have questioned why we don't just sell Pioneer Cottages. The reason we haven't is to continue to main, maintain an adequate inventory of safe, affordable housing for seniors in Port Alberni. If sold to a developer, the cottage could, cottages could be demolished and replaced with high-end condos out of the reach of many seniors' affordability. Although we have an operating agreement with BC Housing, neither society nor the tenants receive subsidies, nor is the society automatically exempt from paying property taxes. And at this time, I'd like to acknowledge the other nonprofit boards in this town and their volunteers who spend hours, volunteering hours, to better the lives of the citizens of this city. As volunteers, we're not experts, which is trying our best to navigate legal documents, contracts, lease agreements, financial, human resources issues as they re relate to being a landlord and an employer. We look forward to hearing your responses to our questions and recommend that Council reconsider our request prior to your vote to accept the recommendations um, as given for, for the per permissive tax exemption for 2020 to 23. We'd like you to reconsider our application for pa uh, permissive tax exemption for the cottages under section 224A of the community charter and to provide our society with clarification of the lease agreement that was made between the city of Port Alberni and the Alberni Clyqua Continuing Care Society that mentions both Pioneer Towers and Pioneer Cottages. And we'd like this information before our society considers seeking legal counsel on the matter regarding the percentage of the land exemption. And with me today are other board members and our manager, Sandra Rose. And if you have any questions, uh, we'll answer them. And we thank you for allowing us to address you today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I think I just want to start by saying um, you've identified a number of, of specific issues that I think certainly um, deserve a response. Okay. Um, I think those responses are probably best able to be provided at staff level because council wouldn't have necessarily the specifics on lease agreements that were made um, offhand, but staff absolutely should be able to provide you that information. So. Um, you know, I don't want to lose sight of that because we won't be able to address it here today. Um, no, I understand. But we do want to make sure that you get those answers. Okay. I think that the bigger issue um, that you're bringing forward is um, whether or not council is exempting um, affordable housing projects as part of our permissive tax exemption policy, and and that's what's going to impact you. You know, to get that exemption or not. Um, and I think it is important to note that um, because you referenced the planning in 2010 that at the time before you rebuilt um, you qualified under the provincial government's um, statutory permissive tax exemption and that wasn't a permissive tax exemption given by council that you were statutorily exempt under the provincial regulation so um, it wasn't necessarily that there was a, a change um, of any council at that point either granting you a, an exemption or not you qualified under the provincial regulation so it's just um, doesn't make it any less frustrating I understand for sure no. um, are there questions from council councillor Haggard thank you madam mayor uh, can I get a point of clarification from you? Mm -hmm. uh, it says in your handout that you gave us, plus the only thing I could find online is the only requirement to live at Pioneer Cottages is, is to be 55 plus. And you talk a lot about affordable seniors housing, but I was always under the impression a senior is going to consider to be 65. And for affordable housing, do you have any kind of means test? So there's a couple of questions in there. Can you talk to that? Prior to our agreement with BC Housing, as I understand it, we legally couldn't means test, but we did endeavor to accommodate seniors of lower income. But now that we're with BC Housing, take it over, Sandra. 
So now, now that um, the society is attached to BC Housing, we're required to do income testing. Um, we've developed a lot of new, like our application has changed and we have to request um, specific tax documents and uh, monthly bank statements and to ensure that uh, anybody coming in is not, falls within the low income range, low to medium income range. Does that answer your question? So what about the ages? Is it 55 plus? Or it's a 65? 55 plus, mm -hmm. yeah. So not necessarily seniors then? That is 55 senior. plus is senior. 60, 60 plus BC Housing provides subsidies too. I mean, ever, there's a lot of different uh, um, age. Like 55 plus is, for the, is, for the, is, is what you can be to move in to either Pioneer Towers or Pioneer Cottages. Right. So BC Housing looks at it uh, uh, um, in order to get a subsidy through their SAFER program, mm -hmm. you have to be 60. Okay. Right. So uh, when you talk about seniors housing, it's not necessarily just seniors housing that you offer that. It is seniors housing, 55 plus. Oh, so I'm a senior and I didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> not at Shoppers Drug Mart, though, unfortunately. <laughs> You're not a senior at 55. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, Councillor Poon. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to clarify something. Um, you said that you're now applying a criteria to the new move-ins, but uh, is that criteria applied to people already living there? And are, are those existing tenants asked to leave if they do not? So we had a meeting with BC Housing last week, and that was a question that we asked them. And the answer is that, that we cannot ask existing uh, tenants for their income information. Um, but anybody coming in, we would apply this means testing. Right? Yeah. And, and as Sandra, back to the senior and affordable, um, as Sandra explained earlier, the percentage of people that already get a safer grant that are residents of the cottages, uh, they, would, they would be considered low, low income. If they get anybody getting a safer grant would be considered because low income. Because they're already being screened by BC Housing. Yeah. So are you able to comment on, on what percentage of the total people living there, either new or existing tenants, get that? that. Our application. Yeah, okay, so we don't see the details of the applications? Oh, you don't? No, we That's don't. So, so we, see the, um, we see the recommendations going forward. Do you um, I just need to hear the question first. So just wondering if you're able to, of your total tenants, new or existing, mm -hmm. um, when you started working with BC Housing, how many are qualified as, as low income? How and if many, you don't have that how many current tenants are qualified at low income? Of all of your tenants. Okay. Well, that's a number that's really hard to address because there was no means testing prior to going into an operating agreement with BC Housing. But I can say that um, any time a safer um, application needs to be renewed, the tenant brings it to me to be signed. So I could safely say half of at least half of the cottages are below BC Housing's requirement for sure okay. and that's helpful just to get a general picture a, a so general even picture. if you don't have a specific Pioneer Towers answer, is, is is I would say almost all of them are low income yeah yeah and Pioneer Towers is receiving um, the permissive tax exemption statutorily right. um, except there might be some discrepancy about the about percentage the this year which yeah. we're going to have our staff look at yeah. okay, okay. Councillor Harpoon Yes, um, so, so how many of your tenants exist before the BC Housing Agreement? We've only, well the BC Housing Agreement was signed in March, yeah. but we didn't actually receive an official copy until June. June, July. I'm going to say we've brought in maybe six tenants, so yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. And they've all been means tested, and they all fall below, yeah. well, way below 71,800. I mean, certainly that's not our, our goal, is to be renting to people that have an income that high, because they, in Port Alberni, the median income is 50,000, which equates to about 1275. They can rent somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Are there other questions from Council? Councillor Haggard. Not so much a question, but a comment. Um, 
I think the general impression in the community, and certainly mine, is seniors considered to be 65. So we do have a lot of seniors living in homes in the community that are 65 years or older, living on a very fixed income. Mm -hmm. And by granting you a permissive tax exemption would download the tax burden on these seniors that are trying to live in their homes that probably don't have any more income or maybe even less than people are currently living in your cottages. So it's a little bit of unfair in that way. Well, people living in residential housing don't qualify per, for a permissive tax exemption. Right. Okay. They qualify for BC Housing's uh, subsidy, perhaps. Maybe the guaranteed income su supplement to offset their income issues. There's other programs out there for sure. And, and also they have assets where, you know, our tenants, especially now we will know from means testing, you know, they don't have assets. You know, people, many seniors, their asset is their home. They don't have a mortgage payment or a rent payment. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know whether the city can figure out for me what the, is it 1.05% of the city portion of the taxes is going, is allotted for the permissive tax exemption? How Maybe much would that? 1.15%. Okay, 1.5. How much would that, like I don't know the number of households in Port Alberni or possibly what your revenue is, but you know, I got a, we did a rough calculation and that might be $25 a year per household is down, downloaded to the residents. I could be totally wrong about that, but maybe somebody in the finance department can enlighten us as to, as to what the burden is for the household taxpayers, the house, the people who are paying taxes on their homes and property. I think we don't have that information likely off offhand, no. but I believe it's our, you know, our total exemptions um, are a couple hundred thousand dollars. And while that may be a small amount um, of the total taxes that are paid, we have to remember that um, giving, you know, a twenty thousand dollar tax exemption or three hundred thousand dollars total of tax exemption is three hundred thousand dollars that we're putting tax burden onto the rest of the taxpayers. So we know. Um, every organization who's getting a permissive tax exemption and some who are not getting them who have applied are very worthwhile tax or very worthwhile mm -hmm. organizations in our community yeah. but we only have so many tax dollars to go around yeah. and that is a con I mean you know you'll hear from multiple um, groups today and not only that but from other groups unrelated to tax exemptions all of the services that we're asked to provide um, it's never easy to say no no, I understand, but I just wonder what the bur actual burden might be. Mm -hmm. Sure. Councillor Solda. Yeah, just a quick question. The people in the cottages and in Pioneer Towers, do they individually pay taxes or is it just We pay set? the taxes. You, the They're renters. The society. Yeah, um, renters don't pay the taxes. Be oh, okay, so because when you are a senior or a certain age, when you live at home in your own home, and you reach a certain age, you get a tax break, right? So yeah. there's two tiers. I think yeah. there's, what is it, 50, 55 or 50? Yeah. Is and, 70 or 1,000? Uh-huh, so they, there is yeah. breaks there, yeah. too. So I, I just thought I'd ask that yeah. question. Yeah, that's true, yeah. And they can, seniors can also defer their taxes. Mm -hmm. So if the society pays that and you don't break it down to the seniors that live there, could they not, I'm just throwing this out, Right, I don't know if, it, if they could pay their own taxes and they, wouldn't they get a better break or it doesn't work that way? No. As a landlord, we pay the taxes, okay. landlords of any place do. Yeah. And I mean the, the permissive tax uh, or the RTB allowable increase in rent for 2020 is 2.6. 2. 2.6. 2. That won't even cover the increase in the water rates oh, I know. that we're going to look at. So, you know, we can never get ahead. Mm -hmm. at all in fact we fall behind every year mm -hmm. and just say just to say the city is 65 as a senior shoppers drug mart is 50 i mean what a bonus yeah. i know right so yeah. it's all yeah. over the map exactly so yeah. thank you okay. thank you okay are there any further questions councillor haggard i wasn't on council last year so please collect correct me if I'm wrong I'm just trying to remember what happened last year during this time you were denied also last year for the, the cottages yeah. yes so what's changed between last year and this year that you think that we should be approved is there any conditions that have changed or well now we've now we are going to be means testing our thing plus we've also uh, accumulated the information as to and I think it's 58 percent of the residents in cottages um, their rent is below market market rent, rent. 
So market rent for a one bedroom is 637 and, and their rent is 615. And then combine that with Sandra's knowledge of the tenants who, who um, qualify for safer. Many of them qualify for safer, so we know that they are way below the threshold. So even though we can't prove to you, and even if we, even when we do means test, we still cannot provide you with proof of somebody's income as opposed to their rent. That's private information, and I and I believe in our tax exemption application, we did show um, the percentage of of the tenants in the cottages who who were their rent was below market rent, and you know we couldn't ascertain fully as to, because I don't, would they all have to get you to sign their safer grant thing? Probably. Oh yeah. As, yeah, a, as so, a landlord, I would have to sign anybody yeah, safer grant. Yeah. yeah. So, so we know that there are many, you know, and I think it's either 52 or 58% of the cottages, uh, the tenants would fall yeah. in that bracket. Thank you very much. Okay. okay thank um, you. Seeing no other questions, thank you for the presentation. Okay, we have no unfinished business, so on to staff reports. Item one is account. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the certification of the Director of Finance dated September 16, 2019 be received and checks numbering 144-479 to 144-554 inclusive in payments of accounts totaling $587,006.11 be approved. Is there a second there? Any comments? All in favor? Carried. And item two from the manager of planning or CAO, um, development variance permit 3978 for 8th Avenue. CAO. Madam Mayor, um, the manager of planning is away and um, because the, um, the project proponent um, uh, desired to see this file move as quickly as possible. We're bringing that forward to council uh, and because you've already seen this file once. So uh, we believe you, you will have comfort with that without the manager of planning being here. Um, and the proponent is in the room if you want to ask questions. So we have a, uh, a development variance permit um, for council's consideration or an application for council's consideration. Maybe we'll just pause for one second if, um, if nice. while people leave for those who are leaving. I'll go with the assumption that they're not leaving because of me. <laughs> uh, Madam Mayor, there's a process to be followed, as you know, and uh, if you'd like to begin that process, I can update you um, at the due course in the process. Okay, wonderful. Um, so we do have the report in our packages. Um, Councillor Washington, would you like to move the first motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. That the report dated September 10, 2019 from the Manager of Planning regarding the proposed development variance permit number 96 be received and Council proceed with the consideration of the development variance permit at 3978 8th Avenue. Second, Madam Mayor. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Thank you. Um, now we're going to move into the formal process. So input received from the public and applicant and comments by staff and Council will form part of the public record of input into the development variance permit application. And could we have background information from the CAO? Madam Mayor, um, in the manager of planning, uh, manager of planning's report, uh, background is the applicant wishes to, re to redevelop the property at 3978 8th Avenue. The, the applicant <laughs> is seeking relief from certain regulations of the zoning bylaw in order to permit the construction of an affordable housing facility targeted to fixed and low income seniors. Um, there's a three-story um, construction or development proposed and it would replace the existing two-story building. Uh, there are a number of uh, reliefs from regulation that are, that are being requested. I'll scroll down to the discussion of the report. Um, this has, uh, by the way, Madam Mayor, uh, this, these recommendations have been considered by the City's Advisory Planning Commission and, uh, and the recommendation to Council is that they be adopted. Um, the property is uh, at 3978 
8th Avenue is designated institutional in the OCP and zone P1 institutional in the zoning bylaw. Um, the new purpose-built development will replace and expand upon the society's current operation of short to medium term beds with extreme weather spaces. I'm just scrolling down. Uh, 21 um, one bedroom units are proposed. Um, prior to this, um, two lots were consolidated to enable this application. Uh, one, as one aspect is that because of the height uh, being above 10 meters in the city's um, building bylaw, there's a requirement to consider shadows, um, casting of shadows, and the proposed building will cast a shadow on a neighboring property, which as I understand it is also owned by the proponent, and so the proponent um, is prepared to, to establish an ease or a, a covenant on that property to, to say they're okay with their, their other property being shadowed. And if I'm, if I'm wrong on that, the proponent can correct me. There, um, the development of 21 units requires 10 parking spaces uh, based on the zoning requirements for one space for three units plus an additional number of spaces based on 15% of the total units. Um, the um, the um, proponent seeks relief from the parking requirement, which we can get to in a second. And the pr proponent also seeks, seeks uh, relief from setbacks from lot lines. So in terms of, uh, down on page 45, there we go, you're right there. Um, the Advisory Planning Commission recommends to Council that you proceed uh, with the necessary development um, by providing the following variances. Um, front yard setback um, from 7.5 meters to 4.8 meters, um, allow that variance. Uh, rear yard setbacks from 9.0 meters to 0 0.5 meters. Lot coverage, total lot coverage, um, allow from 40% a change to 45% and vary the number of parking spaces required um, from 10 spaces to six spaces with a reduction of four, obviously. And um, that city council directs staff to give notice of intent to consider the issuance of a development variance permit at that location. Madam Mayor, does that uh, satisfy that? Thank you. Um, and of course, for council, we have heard this um, or heard a more detailed presentation from the manager of planning when we first considered this. CAO, is there any correspondence? Madam Mayor, we are uh, in receipt of one email um, from Alyssa Bartley. And uh, to summarize the email dated September 11th, 2019, um, expresses concern regarding the number of parking spaces being reduced from 10 spaces to six, um, putting parking pressure on the remainder, remaining neighborhood or surrounding neighborhood. Um, and also um, expresses opposition to a reduction of um, minimum setbacks, particularly at the rear of the building, the proposed building. Thank you. And any late correspondence? None. Okay. And does the applicant wish to make any presentation? Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, all, uh, all I'd like to say is uh, on the setbacks, we must consider the fact that this is a corner lot. So it actually faces Maitland Street is independent seniors, low-income housing. Thank you. Okay, and do any members of the public wish to make a presentation or give input into this process? Okay, seeing none. Okay. Any questions from Council? Councillor Solda. I think it's a great project, but I just have a curi I'm curious to know about the parking. Um, as the email that the city received from six to ten spaces. So where, if it's facing the other way, I'm just visualizing it, where, oh, right in you front of me. I don't need to visualize it. I can actually take it. So the six spaces are actually underground. Well, they are. Okay. Yes. And you've got to consider that low-income seniors, mm -hmm. most of them do not have vehicles. Mm -hmm. And that's why this property is so advantageous. The proximity to shopping, and the services in the neighborhood. They're all within walking distance. It's on a major bus route. So as far as accessing any other services like hospital and that, it's uh, very prime. Plus they have the street parking on the round. Correct, okay. correct. Okay, thank you. Councilor Poon. Yes, thank you. I'm just wondering, um, is there only 
so much space for six parking stalls, or is there more space? I I don't really understand your your question. So, so underground with the with the uh, construction of the building, there's service area incorporated into the yep. basement area that only allows for the six spaces. Do you have space for outdoors parking? Uh, on the street? No, off street. No outdoor. Well, that the the six not spaces within, not within, within the building yes, itself. No. The perimeter. Yeah. No. Okay. Other questions from Council? Councillor Haggard. I'm very supportive of the project, but my concern too was at the APC committee meeting about um, only six parking spaces. And the only reason I'm saying that is from a personal experience. My mother's very low income and she'll never drive her car again, but she's not getting rid of it. Because <laughs> that's kind of their last little bit of independence and they don't want to see that leave. So that was my only concern, but I'm very supportive of the project and thank you for doing it. it it is now i don't know how low income your mother is and that but everybody that goes into this building because it is a bc housing funded building does go through a means test and uh, vehicles are assets mm -hmm. uh, i will add as well in the pro forma the in the application that we submitted to bc housing we are paying the property taxes Thank you. it's a 4.7 million dollar building uh, it should create somewhere between about 44 and 46,000 a year in the tax coffers. Mm -hmm. And a significant amount of housing units. Definitely. You. Uh, when you consider what the, the, you know, the numbers in the community of seniors, average age in, uh, if we go back to the vital signs report, is 50 and it's increasing. Um, we went through this at the at the vital signs. 20.3% uh, of our seniors live below the poverty line, and uh, which is about 2,500 seniors in this community. Uh, it's a significant, significant amount. And I always say that it's a sad day when we can't look after our seniors w within a community. Um, reason why we only went 21 units, we do own the property next door. There is a covenant already in place on that, or it should be in place if the city has signed it. It's been forwarded to them. Um, 21 units, we can create a sense of community within the building. It also opens up for, uh, because of the area in the basement and that, we have space to do servicing and possibly meal programs and that because of the capacity of our society. Thank you. Okay, any further questions from Council? Seeing none. Um, Councillor Poon, would you like to read the motion? Yes, I will. I'll move that development variance permit number 96 to vary the zoning bylaw of regulations as it relates to front and rear yard setbacks, the maximum lot coverage, and the parking requirements at 3978 8th Avenue be authorized by City Council on September 16th. 2019. Second, that. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, carried. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Councillors. Thank you. Moving on to manager's reports from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage. We haven't seen you in a while. Also, please note that much fewer people are leaving when you get up to speak over when our CAO starts speaking. <laughs> I expect an invoice forthcoming from the folks in the audience. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, you have my monthly report in front of you there, and I would be pleased to answer any questions anyone might have. Okay. Questions from Council? No. Oh, Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just want to um, convey congratulations to your our town team for 2019. Uh, the young folks did an awesome job, especially Maya and Jessica was there to help Maya and uh, uh, couldn't have been prouder to be part of the 34th annual event. Thank you. Councillor Haggard. And I just want to thank you for changing the wording to dad's night out to kids night out. Thank you so much for that. You bet. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, seeing no further questions, Councillor Haggard, would you like to read the motion? 
I move that the monthly report from the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Heritage providing information about current department operations be received. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Moving on to item G, bylaws, and item number one from the city clerk, permissive tax exemption. Madam Mayor. I'm going to call a, a perceived conflict of interest on this because of my connections with Porto Players. I am in the midst of directing a show there and I'm a lifetime member and I just don't feel comfortable with that. Okay. So. Okay, um, we do have a report in our packages. Council, are there questions? And we have um, here um, Diane Kosh, who helped us through the Permissive Tax Exemption Committee, if there are questions. Councillor Haggard. Yes, Diane, I have a question for you. The Community Arts Council, uh, they have received a one-time grant from the Women Who Care, mm -hmm. and they'll probably never get that again. And also they re did receive, was it $11,000 from the Alberni Charity Classic? Again, that's not guaranteed from year to year. Was that taken in consideration when calculating that because it was only a one-time thing? No. Okay, is it possible to do that? Uh, could you clarify the answer? Because the question okay. was, um, I think the question was, did those two amounts as revenue reduce their permissive tax exemption? No, 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 no grant from any other organization was taken into consideration on the reduction. Mm -hmm. So it's that's only, not only commercial activities. Okay. Oh, okay. So the grants were the taken. grants. Were, okay. No. So and they made a point that uh, in their gift shop, it's was it the total cost of goods that was calculated, or just their net revenue that was taken into consideration? Do you remember? It was their gross revenue? Okay. Going through all of the financial statements for all of the different organizations, they don't really break down gift shop revenue, and these are all our expenses. So we just had to take whatever they said was their gross revenue for those items. Everything else was built into their expenses. Okay, thank you. Councillor Corbiel. Yeah, a question. When the uh, Senior Citizens uh, oh, Housing Society made their presentation, uh, they pointed out that um, there was no communication from City Hall. Did we not get back and ask for clarification of, of uh, their their uh, presentation, or pardon me, their um, application, or did we just take it at face value and, and When yes clarification no? was required, we would send an email or make a phone call. There were emails sent back to the Society for Clarification. Oh, there was? Yes. Okay. okay. Other questions? Okay. Oh, Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we're going to do three readings today. Uh, at what time can we take into consideration what we've heard today from the present the pres people making presentations this afternoon? Uh, my understanding in terms of timeline is if we want to make changes today, we need to schedule a, we have to have this finalized um, by the end of October or else what I was told by the city clerk is if we do not finalize this bylaw by the end of October, which we only have one more meeting, um, we have to, or then nobody gets a permissive, a permissive tax exemption. Because if we don't file it, then we cannot give a permissive tax exemption to a single organization in the community. So the time to make changes really was when we reviewed it at our last meeting um, or when we reviewed the policy after the permissive tax exemption committee um, put forward the policy. That said, um, if we want to make changes, we can make changes um, and council or staff will schedule us a special meeting. But we do need to have this adopted finally by the end of October. Um, I do have a couple questions. Um, so, speaking specifically to um, the Arts Council, um, they gave some numbers, and I'm hoping I heard these correctly, but $26,000 in 
um, in gross revenue from gift shop sales. 70% of that is the cost. So of course, 30% would be your profit, which is about $7,800 profit. Um, it, it looked to me like the reduction to the tax exemption was $700 of what they received. So that's so I'm wondering what the calculation is. So they've, they've um, their profit on that, which I mean, I want to make sure we're not discouraging organizations um, bringing in other sources of revenue because that was really our, that was what we wanted to push for when we went through this process is we want other, we want organizations to be um, looking for ways to be less re reliant on the city and be more um, independent and, and of course there was a lot of crossover with some organizations getting dollar a year leases and some getting um, community incentive grants and some getting tax exemptions and some getting all of the above. So if their net revenue was $7,800 from that and they received a $700 reduction, is there a certain calculation that's being done in there? Uh, like, is, like what, how did you determine that it would be a $700 reduction? Well, that's based on their assessed value. It's not, it's not me that okay. says that it's, their taxes are gonna be $700. Um, so they basically will end up paying um, taxes on $53,588, okay. which works out for this current year, um, or actually, no, for the 2020 estimated, would be $1,000, $1,014 okay. in taxes okay. is what they would pay. And the, oh, what other questions did I have here? And that's an estimate, because that can change from this okay. year to next year. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to speak to, because we had a comment about um, alcohol sales, um, and again, I think that we didn't want to, as a committee, when we put this policy together, um, the process that we went through was reviewing multiple other, I don't know how many communities we reviewed their tax exemption policies, uh, many. Yes. Um, we certainly don't want to discourage organizations from going out and finding other sources of revenue. In fact, that's what we want to encourage. Um, what we found was that many communities, if you had the ability, if you had a liquor license and the ability to sell alcohol, you were not, um, you did not qualify to get any tax exemption. So we didn't want to go that far because we recognize that it's an important piece. Um, I'm feeling a little bit hesitant on that part of it um, because I, I, like a great point was made about, um, do you want us to go back to, you know, more traditional fundraising activities of just asking for money. Um, I'm not sure if there's maybe other ways that we can address. I mean, I know we have the community investment program as well, and maybe there's opportunities for some of these issues to be brought there rather than permissive tax exemptions. Kind of just thinking out loud. Other comments? Okay. Councillor Poon, would you like to? Read the motion. Yes, I'll move that the report from City Clerk dated September 6, 2019 be received. Okay, is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. Okay, and any further conversation? Councillor Corbiel. Yeah, I just feel there seems to be too many unknowns or, or question marks to, to be moving forward, and if we, if we can delay this, at least by one meeting, um, you know, I I felt the passion when I when I heard those presentations, and I, I imagine most of us have been on those kind of committees where we're just a bunch of volunteers trying to do the best we can. And um, I know in our preamble there we talk about uh, you know we're striving to get people to uh, you know self sufficiency. Well, I can speak for the Senior Citizens Housing Society. Uh, Self-sufficiency won't happen until they pay down the mortgage, which may be, uh, you know, 10 years uh, down the road where the, the rental income that comes in can start to match the mortgage. And as the, was pointed out, I think now you can only increase it by 2.4 or 2.6% 2 a year. Uh, they're really... It, they're between a rock and a hard place, and I don't doubt that the portal players are in the same situation where it's uh, it's difficult to uh, make ends meet, and uh, and likely some other organizations. So, I would uh, love to at least have uh, you know one more chance to to review some of these. And uh, uh, I think the point was made that at the cottages, maybe 58% of the people were uh, they could identify were low income. Maybe there's a percentage of a 
uh, some sort of permissive tax exemption. But um, uh, I mean, it, it's really damn hard to be a volunteer for these organizations. And if there's something we can do to, to help, uh, you know, I think we should do everything we can. So the only thing I would say is um, delaying this without giving very, very specific, like we don't have time to, or opportunity to start this process over. So we don't have time to say, um, you know, let's take another meeting to talk about it because we, uh, the entire community will end up not getting permissive tax exemptions then. If we have very specific instructions to give to staff, we may be able to do that still potentially, CAO. Madam Mayor, the city clerk who's not here has left us a very thorough report on the topic, um, the work that we've undertaken, how we got to where we got to. Um, is it worth reviewing that report now? Will that help council? Or have you all read it and are satisfied that you're prepared to move forward? I don't have any clarifications I need from the report okay. specifically. Thank you. Does anyone else on council? Councillor Washington? Just a question, Madam Mayor. The, the information that we were given in our package, that you've reviewed, you've, you city staff has reviewed all that, haven't they? I'm not sure I understand the question. In the package? When, when they talked about the seniors housing and they, they talked about, they were quoting the charter and all that kind of stuff, that, that's all already been reviewed? The city clerk has reviewed that. Okay. And as I understand it, in the clerk's report, she points out um, what for what areas um, council directed there be exemptions considered and housing is not one of them. Senior services or senior programming is one of them, not, not housing itself. So um, as long as housing is not an eligible, eligible is, as long as housing is not eligible for a permissive tax exemption, then it's a moot point whether it's affordable or not, unless I'm missing the point. Thank you. Councillor Haggard. Just following up on your state of Madam Mayor, uh, could the Community Arts Council and Porter Players, could they apply to our Community Investment Fund for the taxes that they would be paying? Well, that's what I'm wondering. So, I mean, I would say not specifically for taxes, but there may be other ways to assist um, some organizations. I mean, we do have multiple different mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. ways to assist organizations. Um, last year, we gave a $20,000. Um, last year, Sorry, if it, it, it's quite distracting if you're talking in the audience. We're not able to have a conversation. We. Well, this is not the place to have a conversation in the audience. Um, we, have to, we have to be able to debate on council. So um, last year we gave a $20,000 grant to the Alberni Valley Seniors Citizens Home Society through the, permissive, or through the community investment program. Um, anyone can apply to that. So absolutely, if, um, and we can redo our policy whenever we want as well. Mm -hmm. We don't have to redo it every four years or every eight years. We could review it next year if we feel there are different needs in the community. Because I'm sure these two organizations run on a very tight budget and if they have to pay $1,000, that would make it really tight. So maybe they could apply for, like, for something else. They do some kind of project or? Yep. Would that help you? <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> they may already receive permiss or okay. community investment grants as well. I'm not positive on that, but we don't have the information in front of us. Okay, we have a motion to receive the report. I'm gonna call the question on that motion. All in favor? Carried. And Councillor Poon, would you like to continue? Yes, I'll move that permissive tax exemption bylaw 2020, bylaw number 4997, be now introduced and read a first time. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. Okay, then any questions or comments? Councillor Corbiel. Well, one comment in particular. Does this, uh, one of the things that was raised was uh, the land size uh, at the uh, Pioneer Towers was uh, less than the 0.5 acres, which I thought was just for church properties, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, that was something that was going to be looked at. Does this um, sort of preempt that if we pass this today? I would say if there, I mean, the policy is what the policy is. If there's an error in how the Pioneer Towers are being looked at, that will be addressed, um, whether we have, or whether we pass this today or, or not. Um, the 0.5 acres is specifically regarding church properties. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, on first reading of the bylaw, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Councillor Poon? 
Yes, I'll move that permissive tax exemption bylaw 2020, bylaw number 4997, be read a second time. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. Okay, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. I'll move that permissive tax exemption bylaw 2020, bylaw number 4997, be read a third time. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. Any questions or comments? Yes, please. Councillor Washington. I, I, I'm really torn, like Councillor Corbeil is with this, but I'm also afraid that if we drag our heels on this, a lot of other people are going to, like you say, we're going to miss the deadline and everybody's going to lose, not just, a few, not, not, not just a few in the audience today. So it's with heavy heart that I second the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, on the question, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we can call Councillor Solda back in. Okay, and moving on, the um, Places of Public Worship Exemption Bylaw is just a, a follow up on the permissive tax exemption policy, but specifically as it relates to churches. Councillor Washington, would you like to read this one? Thank you, Madam Mayor. The places of public worship exemption bylaw number 4998 now be introduced and read a first time. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. Any questions or comments on this one? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. That the places of public worship exemption bylaw number 4998 be read a second time. Is there a seconder? Okay. All in favor? Carried. And that the places of public worship exemption bylaw number 4998 be read a third time. Seconder. Any final questions or comments on this one? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Okay, moving on to correspondence for action. Okay, item one from the United Fishermen and Allied Workers Union, an email dated August 30th, 2019 from Joy Thorkelson, president, requesting a letter supporting the federal and provincial governments of government officials to provide climate change disaster assistance in the form of income support and financial assistance to commercial fishermen and allied workers to allow vessel owners to keep their boats shipworthy over the winter. And the motion is to receive the letter. Would somebody like to move receipt? So moved. Okay, is there a seconder? Second, Madam. And are there any comments on this? Um, the only comment I'll make is that I think um, on these letters, um, we often get asked to write letters of support um, for things that we really don't have a lot of background on. And so I think that, um, and I'm glad that the motion is just to receive on this, um, because I think based on just one letter, we typically do not have um, information to really take a side on something significant that's outside of our scope. Um, so on the motion to receive, all in favor? Carried. And item two from the districts of Tofino and Squamish. We have an email dated September 3rd, 2019, requesting council join in their response to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change strategy calls for submission regarding proposed amendments to the recycling regulation of the Environmental Management Act to address plastic waste. Would somebody like to read the motion? Madam Mayor. I'll move that the email received by Kelly A. Foxcroft Priori. No, oh, wrong one. Oh, I'll move that the email dated September 3rd, 2019, from the District of Tofino and Squamish, requesting Council to join their response to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategies call for a submission regarding proposed amendments to the recycling regulations of the Environmental Management Act to address plastic waste be received. Is there a second? Sorry, Madam. Second, and this will be discussed uh, more thoroughly at UBCM as well. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. And item three from Kelly Foxcroft Poirier, I always say her last name wrong, White Raven Consulting, an email um, inviting council to participate in the Art of Housing Courageous Community taking place October 4th to 6th. 
And this is council direction received um, because we are not sure if councillors would like to attend this and if anyone's available. Is there any interest for people to attend? Okay. Yeah. Me okay. Too. I'm unfortunately out of town that weekend, so I'm not able to attend either. Councillor Haggard? I think support from somebody from council be there. I was going to another couple of events in October, so I didn't want to volunteer, but if nobody else is able to go, I'll attend. Okay, then I can rearrange and see if I can move things around also, but I agree it's important for someone from council to be there. Okay, um, so I will move that we receive the letter and authorize one councillor <laughs> to attend. So moved, Madam Mayor. Okay, is there a seconder? Second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Carried. On to proclamations. We have one request from the Council of Senior Citizens Organizations of BC, a letter dated September 5th, 2019, requesting that October 1st be proclaimed as International Day of Older Persons in Port Alberni. Councillor Soldo, would you like to read this one? Sure. Madam Mayor, I move that the letter dated September 5th, 2019, requesting that October 1st, 2019 be proclaimed International Day of Older Persons in Port Alberni be received and the day be pre proclaimed as requested. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. Okay, any questions or comments? All in favor? Carried. And on to informational correspondence, City Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so under J1, we have minutes from the Alberni Valley Museum and Heritage Commission meeting. Uh, we have a letter from BC Transit providing an update on the full driver door project to improve safety for trans transport operator operators. Um, item three from the ACRD child care planning team, email dated September 9th, providing an update on recent activities, as well as announcing various open houses taking place in Port Alberni, Ukula, and Tofino. Uh, item number four, a copy of a letter um, from the Industrial Heritage Society and Island Corridor Foundation um, requesting information regarding the subsidy level required in order to operate a safe and sustainable tourism rail service in each of the next five years. And a letter from the city to ICF requesting a meeting to discuss tourism rail in the Alberni Valley and opportunities to work together. Thank you. Would somebody like to move receipt of that correspondence? So moved, Madam Mayor. Okay, is there a seconder? Second. And any comments or items that people would like to discuss? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried. There's no report from in camera, so on to item L, council reports. I will move that council reports outlining recent meetings and events related to city business be received. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. And anything people would like to highlight? Councillor Haggard. I just want to remind everyone about the Women in Business Forum, which is going to be sponsored by the Alberni Valley Chamber of Commerce, will be held October the 16th at Chances Casino. Uh, Mandy Farmer, the CEO of Accent Inns, and Josie Osborne, Mayor Tofino, will be our keynote speakers. Our mayor is going to be giving our welcoming, and I'll be giving the closing. And we have 12 panelists, prominent um, businesswomen from the community will be on the panels discussing three different topics. So you don't have to be in business to attend. You can be in business, thinking about starting a business, an employee, or, you know, retired people working in nonprofits. You're all welcome. You'll get something from it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other items people would like to highlight? Seeing none, uh, on the motion to receive, all in favor? Carried. Are there any new business items from councillors? Seeing none, question period. Item N is an opportunity for members of the public to come forward and ask questions of any business relating to the city. Okay, seeing none, adjournment. Would somebody like to move adjournment? Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. All in favor? Carried. Thank you.